Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you with us here today. I got a few uh, items of housekeeping here that I want to pass along before we begin this morning. First, you should have received either uh, via email or through the U.S. Post Office your giving statement for 2020. Uh, if you have an email on file, then we sent them out that way. And if you didn't open that email, we also sent it out through the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, so you have that for taxes for this year. Uh, if you didn't get that, see me and we'll see that you get another copy of that. Um, so that's uh, we're taking advantage as much as we can the, the email to save us a little on postage and that. Uh, but also in relationship to, uh, to giving, you know, we don't have the offerings going on in our services anymore because of the, the, the COVID. The box is in the, the foyer and you folks are very familiar with that. Uh, but along with that, we've implemented online giving. Uh, so you can use either the app or go to the website and uh, do your giving there. Right now, I think as many as 19 of you are using that. And we, we began that because a lot of people were asking us uh, for it, and it became more convenient in this day and age. So if you have any questions about any of that, you can see me. Also, we sent out in the email a, uh, a packet for our annual business meeting that's coming up on January the 27th. Uh, and if you didn't receive that, uh, there are copies in the back, and it's, uh, there's a, kind of a four-page narrative for the things that we'll be discussing, along with the financial statements for last year and the proposed budget for next year, uh, slate of deacons, the normal things we have. But we also have an amendment to our bylaws that the elders are, are proposing, and it's kind of to bring us in line with uh, some requirements the state of Michigan has for us and uh, as you read it, I think it'll be self-explanatory. If you have any questions about uh, anything in that as well, you can see me and I'll do my best to, uh, to explain it and let you know what's happening there. But again, our, our annual business meeting is Wednesday, January the 27th. So with that, we'd like to begin this morning. And, and we begin our service today with the, the singing of a more traditional hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, which declares God's supremacy by declaring that he's worthy to have bestowed on him not just one, but many innumerable crowns. Uh, he's the matchless king. No one compares with him. He's the eternal king. His reign has no end. Uh, he shows his regal nature in many ways, marrying, wearing many crowns. And our hymn mentions three specifically, at least in the verses that we sing and are on our hymn book and on our sheet today. One, he shows that he's the king of love in his sacrificial death for his own. Greater love has no man than this, than he would give up his life for his friends, right? Two, he shows he's the king of life by coming out of the tomb after three days, showing that even death could not reign over him. And three, he shows that he's the king of heaven, as he has ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father to judge and to rule and to receive the praise due him. So, stand together and add your voices to the endless praise given to our matchless King and crown him with many crowns.
Lord, we join with the elders who in their worship cast their crowns before you singing. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. You loved us in your death, you sustain us in your life, and you reign over us in your sovereignty. Worthy art thou, O Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Christ our King humbled himself in his humanity and gave us a wonderful example to follow. Today's confession encourages us to follow that example and both points us to areas we often fail and encourages us to hold fast. So let's read these words aloud together. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Let's take a moment now to consider where grumbling and disputing may have described you this week and ask for a strength to instead shine as lights in the world. Like runners in a race are encouraged by the crowds who cheer them on and they see the goal approaching, be encouraged by these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. And as we see Christ as our goal, we trust in him, and we do not fear. And so let's take our worship folders and stand and sing in response, Now Why This Fear?
you're being seated. Children are dismissed to Children's Church. And the message that we just sang, we're going to pray over. I look around and uh, I bet you some of you just got here. And maybe your hearts aren't fully in it. And if that's the case, uh, hey, I've got one up on you. I've already had a service in. Um, hey, we're going to pray that the Lord would help us to have that, that sweetness restored. We're going to pray that the Lord would restore that joy. And if you've come barely getting here, limping in, the Lord is ready to hear us. And he's ready for you to be honest. And uh, I trust he will answer these prayers as we lift them up together. So let's pray. Oh Lord, you know us. That can be haunting. You know us for what we are. And you know how easily we can be cool to uh, words about rescue. Complete atonement. They can roll off our tongues and we, I'm with this group, we cannot be moved by it. So in that weakness, Lord, we come to you, the one who can reach inside of us and bring us to uh, joy and peace and life. Help us, Lord, today to reflect on this greatness of being fully forgiven. Help us to recognize this enormous privilege of being called your own. Who you are, what you've promised, and who we are is all that matters in life. We confess that to you, Lord, in our right minds, and yet so easily we can become bent out of shape in life. We can be greater doubters than Thomas. We can be greater idolaters than Israel. We can chase after other things and be all out of sorts. We admit that. But you are that persistent, loving God, that steadfast God that receives us yet again. We come to you in our weakness, asking that you would sort our hearts out, configure us rightly, focus us again, restore the joy of our salvation, such that we see the great blessing, oh, the, the unbelievable blessing to be connected to Jesus Christ by faith. Blow us away, Lord. Energize us. May we have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Jesus Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we together may be filled with all the fullness of God. We pray these big prayers to you, for you are much bigger. You are the infinite, eternal God. And so we bow to you in prayer, asking for your help. Stir us up again. Restore us to life and joy. Make us the people that we have been made to be. Bless this time and help us as we look into your word. And we pray it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Mediator. Amen. David, I was lost in the prayer, and I forgot. I need to come up and read scripture and preach. So. <laughs> the scripture reading is Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to the end of the chapter. Jesus is speaking to the crowds. 
And he says, verse 16, but to what shall I compare this generation? Is it like children? <clears throat> it is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to, be my, <coughs> to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is God's word. Hey, we'll work our way through uh, verse 26 today. And then next week, we'll finish up, we'll look at uh, that last section in more detail. For now, let me just start by saying that last week, someone raised a question to me about a verse in the sermon. They had a question about verse 11. Verse 11 is not reproduced for you in your text. But here it is um, anyway. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So thanks for the question. Um, I'll use that, the answer to the question to introduce today's sermon. So what does Jesus mean? It means that we're more privileged than John the Baptist. In other words, Jesus means that Christians who minister into the world the gospel of Jesus Christ, they do so out of great, great privilege, greater privilege than even John the Baptist because we know things that he did not know. John never saw the redemption of Jesus on the cross or the resurrection or the gift of the Holy Spirit, but we have. And now the least of Christians, so whether you have been saved a few months, weeks even, you're 12, 13 years old, and yet you profess Jesus Christ, you have experienced things that John the Baptist never experienced. And this is an enormous privilege and at the end of the day, it is what determines our greatness, our significance in the kingdom of God. In other words, God has given Christians a means to stand out in this world and to be noticed. And it has absolutely nothing to do with your likes on Facebook or how many stars our church is rated on Google or the degrees that we hold or being a good debater or a great thinker or a nice person. Rather, we stand out as great because we can offer someone a cup of cold water and do it in the name of the resurrected Lord. We stand out as great because we can speak the atoning work of Jesus Christ into the lives of our neighbors who need a greater Savior than good health and a nice home. Our greatness is connected to unpacking the beauty and the wisdom and the forgiveness and the power of the reigning Christ. John the Baptist couldn't do that. John the Baptist dies by chapter 14. All of that doesn't happen until chapter 28 and beyond. 
And because we can experience those things, it is an enormous privilege. And it is out of that privilege that we now go out into the world and minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, I would say the more one understands their privilege, the greater witness they will be. But as we know, not everyone we encounter or engage with the gospel of Jesus Christ (laughs) is going to feel the same way that we do. The text gives us two kinds of people that we will encounter when we go out on mission. The first, we will encounter unhappy people. And the second, we will encounter apathetic people. That's the way I'm summarizing these two group, these two sections of Scripture. The unhappy, dissatisfied people, the apathetic, indifferent people. And as we work through the text today to discover what Jesus has to say about them, I wouldn't be surprised if Jesus has something for you and me too, those who claim Jesus Christ. Perhaps you came today unhappy, dissatisfied. Perhaps you came today apathetic and indifferent. What could you learn? Well, let's go into the text. First, the unhappy, the dissatisfied. This is verses 16 through 19. And in this very brief section, Jesus gets really creative. He uses the play of children in the marketplace to make his point. You can see it there in that indented verse, verse 17. And what he's doing is painting a picture of unhappy and dissatisfied children to make his point. So let's work through these verses for a couple of minutes to see what Jesus is saying. He says in verse 16, but to what shall I compare this generation? And then... He remembers back to times that he has no doubt been in the marketplace doing some shopping and sees children playing. In fact, the very people that he's talking to are likely um, familiar with the same kind of scene. In fact, they may have children who used to play like this. The, The picture that Jesus paints for us is of a child who has been dropped off with a group of friends in the marketplace while mom goes off and shops. And so the child gets to his friends or her friends and says, hey, let's play a game. I would like to play a happy game. Let's play a game that we can sing and dance. Let's play a game that we can use a flute with a happy tune. And you know how to do it? You, you play wedding. Is that what, that's what you do, because the wedding game is a game that would include a flute and happiness and joy. So let's play wedding. So you be the groom, and you be the bride, and you be the parents that are never satisfied for their baby. And, you know, that's how we'll do it. And all the kids say, nah, I don't want to play that game. We played that game last week. That would be boring. Well, okay, let's go to the other end then. How about we play a sad game? Let's play a dirge. Let's let's play a, a game that the flute demands a minor key. Let's play funeral. Okay, so you play the body, and then you play the mourners, and that's how we'll play. And the kids say, no, I don't want to play that game either. No, I don't want to play that game. That's boring. And then Jesus takes that illustration and he begins to teach from it in verse 18. Well, you see, John came neither eating nor drinking. John lived out in the wilderness. He lived an austere life. He ate locusts and wild honey. He didn't come into town. He didn't eat with people, dine with people like Jesus did. He lived an austere life. And he lived a different kind of life. And so, so different that some people started to say, there's something wrong with John. There's something wrong with this guy. He's a little off. You know what? He's got a demon. Jesus says, let's go to the other end. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, verse 19. That is, Jesus didn't live out in the desert. He didn't live an austere life. He traveled. He got to know people. He went to parties. He socialized as he spoke about the kingdom that he, was, that he was bringing in. But what do they say about him? Oh, this Jesus. <laughs> you know, when you hang out with people who eat like that and drink like that, then he could be nothing more than a glutton and a drunkard. And by, by the way, he's got friends of tax collectors and sinners, and everybody knows that you're associated with the people that you hang out with. No one's happy. Unhappy, dissatisfied people. 
And that is what Jesus is presenting to us. These are the kinds of people that we will face in life. They will not be happy with our ministry for Jesus. In fact, they will often reject it. And Jesus does not want us to be naive. Jesus never told us that pleasing people would be easy. Never. We go out into an unhappy, dissatisfied world. And many people will pout like the children do here in the marketplace. So in our presentation of the gospel, we may present a facet of the gospel which emphasizes a self-denying aspect of Jesus, a repentant aspect of Jesus. After all, Jesus himself said, anyone who will come after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And people will reject that and say, you know what, um, I need a little more freedom than that. You know, I, I need a, a little more freedom than what Jesus offers for me to be me. And you go to the other end and you say, okay, you present a uh, part of the gospel or a facet of the gospel which emphasizes the liberating aspect that Jesus gives us. Only Jesus turns us back into the kind of human beings that we were intended to be. And so Jesus himself said, if you are burdened and weary, come to me for rest. If you're tired of the world pushing on you what it means to be human, come to me. And I will show you what it really means to be human, to be underneath the authority of God with your sins forgiven. People will say, I'm not that needy. I don't need that. Again, there will be a rejection. It's fascinating, isn't it? John's ministry was solemn. Jesus' ministry was joyful. If our ministry is too solemn, then people complain it's not upbeat enough. If it's too joyful, then people complain it's not serious enough. And over and over it goes. And yet Jesus concludes this section and says, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Meaning that the deeds of John the Baptist, that is, this decision to not eat and to not drink and to preach this message of repentance, is rooted in wisdom. And as we know, wisdom is always rooted in the fear of the Lord. And so to talk about repentance is to actually fear the Lord. It's to say, look, you got to change your ways if you, if you really do fear the Lord. In other words, eventually John's deeds will be proven wise. Or take Jesus, for example. Jesus, with the joy that he brought into people's lives, those were his deeds. And eventually, those will be proven wise because that is also rooted in the fear of the Lord. You fear the Lord enough to repent, and then while you are in his presence and he could take your life like that, he won't because you're in Christ. And that just brings great joy and confidence as we live alongside the king, the sovereign king. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. And so as John the Baptist ministered the truth, as Jesus ministered the truth, as we minister the truth, we do so whether people are pleased or not. Now is there another application here? I think there is. We ought to take this to heart, Bethesda. Let's be careful as we minister that we are not unhappy, dissatisfied, and pouting people. Not simply because that in and of itself is wrong. We know that, right? We, we confess this today in our confession section. Philippians chapter 2, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Let's make sure that we're not the disapproving type. And, and this text is fascinating from Philippians. I don't know if you noticed it when we read it, but it's rooted in mission. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Why? That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. So when John sings the dirge to repent, we all repent. And when Jesus teaches joy and happiness, that we rejoice because out of encouragement of being in Christ, that we be those kinds of children, not the kind that grumble and dispute because a twisted and crooked generation is watching, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So, 
We fight against these attitudes and postures of unhappiness and pouting, not simply because they're wrong, but also because they do not properly reflect the Jesus that we serve, the one who went to the cross with the joy that was set before him. And that is an enormous privilege to have a happy God because of the death of Jesus Christ for us. You see, we, we minister out of privilege. We minister out of privilege. So those are the unhappy kind. Then, in the next section, we come to the apathetic and the indifferent. And that's verses 20, and 20 through 24. 20 through 24. Let me start off by saying that on the surface of these verses, Jesus is really not teaching us anything new on the surface of these verses, okay? In summary, Jesus is saying on the last day, he will judge those who do not repent of their sins. So Jesus came so that people would be right with God, but if they refuse to change their ways and believe, then there's nothing left for Jesus to do but to denounce them. Again, verse 20. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. So it's either to be accepted by Christ or to be denounced by him. There is no third way. It would be good for us who live in the 21st century in a place and a time which loves options to remember two outcomes for our lives, heaven or hell. There is one way, and Jesus happens to be it. Listen, that's Christianity 101. And as I look around the room, I'm pretty sure that everybody here grasps at least some of that. There's not really anything new. But there are some new things here as we dig underneath the surface. Some truth that is amazing, that is sobering, we don't talk about often. And if we will take it in and listen carefully, it just might drive us to our knees in greater humility and repentance. So I want you to think carefully with me through a couple of points. First, notice that Jesus does not denounce all the cities in the same way. He lists a number of cities here, doesn't he? Chorazin, Bethsaida, Tyre, Sidon, Capernaum, and Sodom. All of these cities will be judged. None of these cities repented, and yet there are differences between them, and, may, and Jesus makes distinctions. And here's the major distinction that he makes. He is far, far harder on the cities of Galilee Remember, Galilee is the region where Jesus did most of his ministry. So he is far, far harder on the cities that are in that region, like Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. Cities where he preached the gospel and where he performed his miracles. He's far, far harder on them than he is on the cities which were known for their paganism. The cities of Tyre and Sidon and Sodom, where he never preached or did miracles. You might remember the Old Testament city of Sodom from the book of Genesis. Well, that was around long before Jesus came on the scene. Jesus never preached there. Jesus never did miracles there. And, that, and the city of Sodom was destroyed for its immorality. The New Testament cities of Tyre and Sidon, these cities which are far up the Mediterranean coastline, far up from Capernaum, where Jesus spent most of his time ministering, those cities were known for their affluence and for their arrogance. They were secular through and through. But Jesus says in this text, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for them than for places which heard my words and saw my works, like Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, and did not repent. And so Jesus is saying that in eternity, 
There are degrees of punishment based on how much spiritual truth one had or did not have in this lifetime. That's the only way these verses make sense. Those who have been given more gracious disclosure of God's truth but remain apathetic and indifferent will receive the greater penalty. And then to push the point home, look at what Jesus does with the city of Capernaum in verse 23. And you, Capernaum, you will be exalted to heaven, you will be brought down to Hades. The height that they thought they would achieve because they had the privilege of hearing Jesus preach and perform miracles, yet without repentance, will bring them to Hades, to death. There's an allusion here, by the way, to Isaiah 14, where God is talking about judging the king of Babylon. Listen to these verses and see if they sound in, um, in any way familiar to what we just read. The prophet Isaiah prophesies in Isaiah 14, starting with verse 12, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit, Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. This king of Babylon, who believed himself to be privileged, will be brought low in judgment. So, what's the application for us? What is the application for us? Well, let me speak to you students who are in the room. And everyone else is allowed to listen in, okay? Over just the last couple of years, our students have received from the teaching and ministry of Jonathan and his team, okay, have received far, far more than Christianity 101. Far, far more than the basics. You have received talk and truth about the beauty of creation, our sovereign God, how the Bible is put together, how you as a human being is put together, what you need to do to respond in faith and repentance. You have been given so much, so much has been given to you. So much has been disclosed to you by our gracious God through the means of his servants. And yet, if you do not repent of your sins, if you do not repent, you will find the greater penalty in judgment than perhaps your next-door neighbor who hasn't had the privilege that you've had. Do you see? How about another application? There are people like Capernaum, the city, who pride themselves on their theological knowledge, who pride themselves on their connection to popular theologians or speakers, who like to say, oh yeah, I was there the time that he preached that. Or yes, I watch him on YouTube all the time. Yep, yep, yep. That means nothing unless you repent. The only thing that does is lift you higher and higher and higher. And there will be a great price to pay for that. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians when he says, some of you are of Apollos and some of you are of Paul and some of you are of Peter. You know what Paul is saying there? He's saying, there's a lot of people in the church today who look for a patron. They want to connect themselves with somebody or something that they think is important. It's kind of like wanting to say, I graduated from the University of Michigan. Great thing to graduate from the University of Michigan. But what about all those poor people who graduated from University of Michigan Dearborn? Or University of Michigan Flint? We're looking for patrons. 
It happens out there. It happens in the world. It happens here in the church. That will mean nothing unless you repent. And so we must not remain apathetic or indifferent because by God's grace we have escaped the judgment of God and that should impact our spirits for living. And yet, we know, those of us who are out on mission, we know that it can become a very discouraging thing to constantly rub shoulders with unhappy and apathetic people. We know that. What should we do? I think we need to take our cue from Jesus, verses 25 and 26. Jesus, who himself ran up against these people, as we've seen in the text, at that time declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Fascinating that Jesus thanks the Father for the supposed ineffectiveness of his mission. He thanks the Father that he has kept back truth from some people. We need to take our cue from Jesus. Now, let me help you. I think that Jesus' understanding of the Father is better than ours. Because you'll see, after he says Father, he also says Lord of heaven and earth. He rules everything and reigns over all. And therefore, while we may become discouraged and a little anxious in life through our mission, Jesus never did and prays to a Father in heaven who is undisturbed, unbothered, knows exactly what he is doing, and Jesus is confident in the Father's will. The Father's will, which Jesus describes at the end of verse 26 as, as gracious, as gracious. Jesus is praying to a sovereign God, and that's the first tip as we end. If you're discouraged, you need to spend more time praying and thanking God that he's directed things the way that he has. But the second thing is to be reminded, I think, of his greatness, of his power, of his sovereignty. And I want to close by reading some verses out of Romans chapter 9, where Paul is developing his argument of God's sovereignty. And I'm going to drop us right into the middle of the argument, but I think you'll pick it up. Because God is sovereign, Paul says, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy? which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Look, John the Baptist never heard those words. Never heard God's sovereignty spoken of like this. Because Paul lived after John. John didn't have that privilege. We do. 
what an enormous privilege that we have been given. And it's from that privilege that we go out and minister. And may God give us the joy and happiness. May he give us an interest and a curiosity, not just about this world, but about people, the very people that we're ministering to. May they sense that from us. And may through that God work his gracious will in their lives and in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we bow before you and long to better understand your gracious and judging nature. And so we, through the prayer, strike now while the iron is hot. We ask for those in our our room today who have not yet bowed the knee to Christ, who have not repented of their sins, that you would be gracious to them and allow them to do so. And Lord, for those of us who claim Christ, may we be reminded through this sermon, through these words of our own arrogance, um, of those thoughts which lift us up and remind us that true life in you is lived on our knees in humility. We thank you, Lord, for these words and pray that you would bless them to us in Christ's name. Amen. If you're anything like me and you uh, hear the word what or read the word what, you suspect there's a question coming up next, but that's not always the case. If I were to say to you, what a lovely wife I have, I wouldn't be asking to hear your opinion on the matter. In fact, I'd be telling you something that I believe, and I'd be telling you rather emphatically that I believe that. Well, our closing song begins with that word, what, as well. But it's not asking a question, but it's making an emphatic statement. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? Such a gift of grace that there's nothing else that heaven could give. Take your worship folders and stand and join us in singing, Yet Not I, but Through Christ in Me. and
so this blessing to go out on today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, not chapter 9, but chapter 11, starting at verse 33, where Paul praises God, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Go minister with that thought in mind this week. Amen.